Well, good evening and welcome to another edition of uh, Sci-Fi Night here at TELUS, part of uh, our various efforts to teach science. I'm so glad you've come here uh, this evening uh, to be here for the program. I'm David Dundee, I'm Director of Education. Just tell you a couple of quick things that are coming up uh, in our Lunch and Learn series. It's a noon series uh, on uh, various Wednesdays. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, interesting small talks uh, uh, aimed at uh, young and old. And so uh, this Wednesday we have a, uh, a, a lecture on light and uh, talking about the different properties of light and, uh, and the uh, spectrum of light. And then on uh, July 20, uh, we have Dr. Matt Sitkowski, who is the chief uh, editor-in-chief uh, of uh, the Weather Channel, will be here talking about hurricanes. And uh, then on August 31st, uh, we have a, a virtual guest, uh, a uh, astronomer from uh, uh, JPL, that's going to be talking about the first uh, images coming from the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And speaking of that, keep an eye on our website because we will be announcing shortly. Uh, 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 TELUS is one of the national uh, partners with NASA, and so there will be a simultaneous uh, release of the very first images from uh, the Webb Telescopes coming up in the next few weeks, and we will broadcast the exact time and uh, date if you would like to be in the exhibit hall to see it come up on our big screen. So uh, that's kind of exciting. Moving on to July 16, we have a program called Wild About Weather, and we have all sorts of interactive activities. Uh, we have a group of scientists coming up from Georgia Tech with it, uh, from the uh, Georgia Research Institute, uh, talking about uh, uh, weather prediction. And uh, Glenn Burns will be here also. Uh, to, to give a talk about weather. So, oh, ooh, some Glenn Burns fans out there. Very good. And uh, so he'll, he'll be here, so please, please come to that. And uh, uh, in our uh, lecture series, our next lecture was uh, August uh, 26, and we'll have Scott Sutcher here talking about opal digging uh, uh, in, uh, in Australia. So that, uh, that's uh, coming up there. And then we have virtual uh, science guests that we host here at the museum. And our next one on July 13th, you can tune into on our Facebook uh, or uh, YouTube platform out of the museum. We have one on model rocketry, and George Blanco, a local rocketry expert, uh, uh, will uh, be talking about some of his adventures in rocketry. And then later on in August, we'll have our own Ryan Roney, who is our paleontologist and curator here, talking about adventures with fossils. So all sorts of exciting things coming up, and uh, just stay tuned to our website to try to keep, keep up with all the exciting science we do here at TELUS. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my boss, uh, our executive director, Jose Santa Maria. Thank you so much, David. And uh, yeah, I. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of wild, uh, I'm really excited about uh, tonight's speaker and tonight's subject. Uh, energy, it's something we're discussing all the time, and we're not talking about the price of gas either. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're keeping track of the war in Ukraine and Europe, uh, all of a sudden realizing we're buying gas from the wrong people. Uh, and, and, and so what are the solutions? What are the solutions to, to really uh, dependable, safe energy, uh, uh, to uh, reducing carbon emissions, and to me is nuclear power, uh, safe nuclear power. Nothing is more intriguing to me but than this capability, not just to have a massive plant in South Georgia, but portable nuclear plants. And that's what the subject of tonight's uh, speaker uh, is going to be about. So uh, Claudio Filippone. I uh, was, uh, not yet, not yet, <laughs> no, I, gotta, I gotta say a few things about you, including what I just learned. So he, uh, he got his degree, electrical engineering, at the Instituto Industri Industriale G. Marconi in, uh, in Italy, and uh, he was working in industry, got fed up, hopped on a plane to America with no plans. Ended up getting his master's and PhD at the University of Maryland, and he's now the uh, president of CEO of a Holos Gen, uh, the company he's going to talk about. He um, originally from uh, uh, Trento, uh, Italy. He now lives in College Park, Maryland. Let's give a warm welcome, <laughs> warm, warm welcome to Dr. Claudio Filipponi. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
can you guys hear me okay? All right, perfect. So thank you for having me here. Uh, um, thank you for dedicating your uh, Friday night or Friday evening to this event. So yes, I'm going to talk to you about um, these portable, uh, trans uh, transportable uh, microreactors. Uh, these uh, render images are showing you a 40-foot container with a uh, fully, com I mean, comp uh, complete reactor. So there is not nothing else you need. Just attach the power cable and you get power for uh, more than eight years, about 8.3 years. Uh, 10 megawatt is the power rating of this device. And this is the result, as you, I'll show you shortly, of uh, several years of uh, scrutiny from national laboratories and academia. Uh, since it is very, you know, uh, presumptuous claim that you can pack a reactor in a container, and we have proven that actually is very feasible, and in a way it was actually done in the 50s and 60s also. So we are not inventing that much uh, news here. So uh, let me go straight to the next one. Let's see if I can do it this way. Okay, does it work? Let's do it this way. Okay. So this slide is just to show you. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a little flavor of what the problem is, or in general the problem is, and go back and forth with this problem so they will cement in, uh, in your mind more because there are a lot of terminology, things that if you're not you know, uh, in this field, might not be that easy to remember. So what uh, I'm showing in this slide, essentially we have normally what we call uh, large or li light water reactors, small motor reactors, and now what we are trying to develop is are basically micro reactors. So the difference is essentially in the power rating and the topology of the reactor itself. So in this case, you would see here, um, I might actually, could I have the uh, laser pointer on the computer? It would be much easier than using the, uh, the um, laser here, uh, if, if possible. While, while she's trying, okay, perfect, that's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. So, beautiful. So uh, what you see here essentially are uh, the power rating of different type of reactors. The size is uh, uh, for a large water reactor is normally above 250 megawatt. Um, below that amount, is even though there is not exactly a defined threshold around the world, I in different countries, light, well, I mean large and small are somehow different. Uh, below 250 megawatt, you get a, a small modular reactor. And then what I've been basically proposing for several years are reactors so small that they break all these rules about economy of scale because you can replace them with factory manufacturing. The size is so small you can mass produce them. So the cost can drop dramatically for that reason. So one of the issues in general is that all the reactors that uh, we know about are these relatively large plants with a lot of concrete and rebars. So this means a lot of site preparation. Some sites are not uh, proper for a reactor because there might be seismic activities or flooding frequency or uh, extreme environmental conditions like uh, tornadoes or frequent, uh, frequent uh, natural events that uh, put the reactor into jeopardy. Uh, so um, the general approach is that you always have this massive containment, massive construction, a lot of concrete, a lot of rebars, which takes a lot of time and costs a fortune to make. So the type of reactor that you would find around are water reactor, gas reactor, small modular reactor like this one on, the, on uh, where the, the cursor is at this moment. The efficiency of these reactors is essentially the amount of energy you get for the amount of thermal energy you create in terms of fissioning the fuel. So the higher the efficiency, it means the less amount of spent fuel you will produce for that megawatt that you're trying to produce. So uh, that said, what I'm going to talk about in more details are how do we get from a reactor that has a lot of equipment, a lot of piping, conduits, electrical uh, cabling, sensors, miles of wires, literally, from one point to another, to something that actually can fit inside a 40-foot container or even smaller, a 20-foot container. So what we had to develop to do this is the elimination of the so-called balance of plant. So this is the BOP, and you will hear this a couple times during the presentation. So, so that said, I'm going to go a little bit detail in, into detail about the balance of plant. So the balance of plant is essentially the network of pipes, tubing, and conduit, as I was saying before, that connects, for example, 
In this design, you have a reactor here. The reactor produces steam. The steam is piped through this piping jungle that you see here. Then it goes, finds its way to the turbine, spins the turbine, expands, and eventually goes to the condenser. The condenser becomes liquid again. There is a pump, brings it back, puts it back cold. This, uh, this green, I mean, this uh, blue, li uh, blue line here, puts it back into the reactor and redoes the cycle. So this is a typical ranking power cycle. So as you can see, uh, this is actual real reactor. This is a Carem Argentinian uh, small modular reactor. These, all these elbows you see here is because there are barriers. There are penetration through thick walls of concrete. So, um, so you have to avoid that, but also you have a problem with, uh, if you have a earthquake, this pipe starts to oscillate. So they could break because of that. So you have to have hangers, dampers. All of these cost a lot of studies, a lot of engineering, and a lot of maintenance. So cost, you can see the dollar sign continuously piling up because of all of these things that have nothing to do with the actual real production of electricity. It's all these supporting structure, you need to have that. So every time you have an elbow, you have also a reduction, you have friction, you have uh, um, uh, fluid velocity, corrosion caused to the tube, so you have to have a, a material degradation program that monitors that elbow frequently so that you, you can predict when it's going to fail. So before it fails, you shut down, cut that pipe, put a new elbow, and reweld it and start over. So as you can see, all of this architecture costs tremendous amount of work and tremendous amount of uh, labor hours which means, in the end, operational cost. So um, the, this is another example of a so-called unitized reactor where the equipment is placed very close. For example, I have a flange maybe here that connects this piece of equipment to this piece of equipment. So there are two flanges and then a big pipe that goes all around and find the equipment. In this case, uh, what they did, they took equipment one, equipment two, put it together without putting an actual pipe. So we put this flange with this flange together. So it's a, a, a strong optimization. And uh, this is too compact more the reactor to be useful, for example, for ice breakers, where you don't have that much room. So that's again another, so you're going toward the right direction. So what I did, I took this principle and went to the extreme and eliminate even fur further that amount of equipment. So what I'm going to talk about, these are a courtesy of Microsoft PowerPoint where you go from Mac to <laughs> To power to 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 PC, I see things that you know text that moves around. So it's, uh, it's the way it is. We have to. I, I see here, legacy reactors. So and you know for something happens. Right? So apologies for that. It's just when we went from Mac to PC. So uh, what I'm going to yeah. So I apologize for all these little uh, uh, things, but uh, bear with me. Uh, it will be un it will be worth it. So what we're going to talk about is what is so the inefficiency of a reasonable, I mean, a current designs, then how do, how do we really increase performance? Because we want to not only improve the, the cost of operation of the reactor, but we also want to lower the capital expense of the reactor. And also we want to reduce the amount of spent fuel we produce. So the only way to do that is to make more energy out of that thermal energy that the core can make. So that's the other step. Then are, are we saying something that, um, you know, it's just a wishful list or is real? So you have to have third parties, expert, subject matter expert that can look at this objectively and actually throw arrows at that and try to shut it down to say, no, this is a baloney, this is not really working as you're saying. So we had a lot of uh, thermodynamic, thermohydraulic, neutronics, structural, electronic controllers, uh, digital instrumentation, police that checked the design. And uh, that was something I wanted uh, for credibility. So you first prove it works, then you go out and look for money, essentially. That's the idea. So um, then uh, the design architecture has to be such that it's flexible, so you can adapt it to almost any application that is out there, whether it is uh, charging a, a car, an electric vehicle, or uh, a be a support to renewable, like solar or wind, uh, desalination, process it for hydrogen production. So you name it, there are many uh, applications. So the reactor has to be designed inherently, uh, ready to attach it to any application. So you don't have to redesign the reactor, modify it again for that specific application. So very challenging from an engineering standpoint. The objective ultimately is to eliminate or mitigate fossil fuel independence with all the ramification that you have for that. 
and of course, uh, reduction of pollution, uh, reduction of thermal pollution, reduction of pollutant uh, in the air, and eventually also uh, address the issue with global warming. So all of this is basically what all of this is trying to be to, to, to accomplish. So this is to cement a, a little bit of summary of what I said so far. So this is a uh, you know, very high elevation schematic of a typical power plant. So you have a gigantic dome here, which is a one of the most expensive part of building a reactor. Uh, this is you know, several feet uh, width with tremendous amount of rebar. So there's a lot of steel in this construction and takes forever to make this construction. So years to fabricate this. Then inside you have your core, you have equipment. So these are steam generators and pumps. And then you have pipes that bring uh, cold water in, uh, relatively cold water in, to warm up through the core, become steam, and go and find a turbine, spin the turbine, create electricity, connect to the grid, and then get the steam exhaust from the turbine, condense it, pump it through pump back through a big tower for condensation, back into the reactor. So all of this to make megawatt electric at the end of the day. So as you can see, these are the typical power ratings of these large power plants. You see there are many buildings. Uh, this is called Nuclear Island. Uh, this, is, uh, the, this is the Nuclear Island. There is uh, the uh, control uh, building. There is the um, uh, radi radiation uh, and uh, radioactive waste building. Uh, there is the turbine building. So each building has its own uh, features and each building has very thick walls that have to be penetrated through with these big pipes all the time. And every, s every now and then, even where the, the interface between the concrete and the pipe is, you have corrosion, you have uh, uh, issues with, uh, with the deterioration of the material. So you have to replace that, monitor that. Every time you have to do something, it's money, essentially, plus risk. You have more risks into your, your picture. Plus, if you break any of these pipes, you lose your coolant. And if you lose your coolant, the reactor, especially the uh, generation three and three plus, all the old fashioned reactors need to have coolant at all times. So there are all these redundancy, which means more expenses again, uh, emergency power, um, double grid connection, different kilovolts for, for each uh, grid to increase the probability that if one system is broken, you can have another system that could work at different voltage. So there are a lot of embedded redundancy, all of this to ensure the core never starve for water. There's always water there. When water is not there, we know what happened. I mean, we have seen some uh, uh, major nuclear accident in the world. And even though when I was a student, I was told that the probability for a, uh, for a reactor meltdown is one in 86 years. I'm 56, I've seen three of them. So those probabilities <laughs> don't really work well. So I don't trust probability, so I'm much more um, you know, practical. So how do we innovate this? Um, so what I'm showing you here is essentially the principle of having a shipping container. Why shipping container? Because the, the, the infrastructure to transport uh, this container is already in place. So the entire world is equipped with crane, forklift, and uh, uh, shipping, uh, whether it is rail or um, marine vessels or barges, they're all equipped to handle this format. So it's a standard. So we want to stay with that. Of course, uh, this is not a conventional shipping container. It looks like a shipping container, but it's a heavily engineered. So it's uh, much more reinforced. There is a lot of shielding. There is a lot of uh, engineering components inside this ISO container. But from the outside, it has the same characteristics uh, for, uh, the, uh, uh, for the infrastructure to grab it, move it around, as it does for any other cargo that you can see. So um, the idea for me was, uh, well, if you pack so much energy inside such a small space, the problem is that the core occupies most of the container. So if the core occupies most of the container, you don't have much room for cooling, sorry, for cooling, for uh, shielding. So as soon as you operate a reactor, really after a no time that you operate it, it starts to produce fission fragments, which are the radioactive part of of nuclear, and now you have a radioactive system. Now you have to put shields. But if you put shields in that system, now you have to put shields outside of the container, which violates my own requirement, which was it cannot exceed the, uh, the, the standard of a shipping container. So to do that, I broke the core into four pieces, but you could break it in two or three or N pieces. 
And each piece contains a fraction of the core, in this case, one quarter of the core, as you can see here. And the power conversion system, which is a, this is a gas system, so it's high temperature. The power conversion system is integrated with the core. So there is no piping going outside to find the equipment to convert the thermal energy into electricity. So um, we if you do that, by eliminating just the balance of plant, you automatically increase efficiency. But also you decrease dramatically your cost. You have so much less components to deal with. But also you decrease the regula regulatory analysis for safety because you have much less number of components to do a probability risk assessment and therefore license that component. So all of this is toward the idea of let's make it so compact and so simple that you um, uh, have very little um, components to monitor so that it's also easier to control for a safety standpoint. So this next slide shows you essentially here you kind of insert them as a, as a shelf, and when they're all together, the reactor becomes uh, whole. That's holos means whole in Greek. I was looking for an Italian word that was so catchy, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, so I had to use Greek, a Greek, a Greek word to do that. So, uh, so holos means whole together. So only when all these four things are together, then you have a critical system. Because if you take a piece out of the core, you automatically uh, break, breach the uh, buckling and the geometric um, buckling, which is means if you have to have so, so, much ma so much mass and so much geometry to make this reactor work. If you take a piece out of it, the reactor is subcritical automatically. So what I was doing this is basically each of these guys is subcritical, and only when they are together, they actually become a reactor that can function. So that said, is sealed. Each one of these guys is sealed so they can be transported independently. And now you have plenty of room to surround one of these guys with all the shields you need inside the perimeter of a shipping container. So that is the novelty for that part. The other novelty is that we're using much more modern technology. So we're using inverters, converters, that are used for solar power, for uh, wind power, for electric vehicles, for jar charging stations. So we are using high-speed motors, electric motors, uh, we're using also magnetic bearings, so the shaft is never touching any metal. So that means you don't need lubrication because it's basically levitated all the time. Even during transport, the energy required for the magnetic bearings to keep the, the shaft in, in check without touching anything is not that much power. So you can put batteries and keep it in uh, suspension, in levitation, during the entire transport for several hours. So that way you don't need lubrication. It also means that you don't need to have a pump, a filter, a balance of plant for the lubricant to be filtered and cleaned or replaced. So again, simplification, simplification, simplification. So the other novelty is that uh, the shaft in a typical, um, in a typical um, turbo compressor type of system or type of power conversion system, you have that the turbine, which is what generates power, is coupled mechanically to the compressor. And uh, this is what happens in an airplane. If you, uh, if you look at your turbojet, when you're looking out of the window, you see the turbofan, and there is a gearbox, but in the same shaft, there is also the turbine that is actually powering the turbofan. So mechanically, they are always married together. Instead, what I did, no, because if you separate them, the efficiency of these two turbo machinery components can skyrocket, because you don't have the dependency of speed of one versus the other. And the compressor wants to speed a, diff a, speed, a different speed than the, tur the turbine that you see here. So that said, um, let me just keep an eye on the time, just I don't want to, because I could talk for, uh, forever. So, okay, that's good. So that said, um, there is a big chunk of novelty in the fact that the turbo, comp the, the compressor, these are the turbo machinery of the compressor, are decoupled from the turbo machinery of the expander. So in other words, the generator generates power. Part of the power goes to, sorry, goes to power the actual motor that is pushing the compressor. All of this is done electronically with modern inverters. So a line of code, and you can decide the speed of the motor. And the motors now can go to 22,000 RPM, 26,000 RPM, even higher. And so you have very high efficiency at those conditions and very little wear and tear because it's, it's not touching anything. So that's uh, part of the novelty here. So what was done in the past and uh, what happened in the past versus today? 
So this is a picture from 1956. And uh, also on the Yolos Giant website, you can find a lot of history. I put, uh, put a lot of pictures of the past. There are a lot of declassified documents that you can access now and learn uh, how beautiful technology was developed in the 50s and 60s. So this was a turbojet for the nuclear bomber. And it literally took a turbojet, cut off the, the combustor, put a core in the middle, uh, right here, put a core there, and then put a big shaft that goes from here to here to so that the turbine is powering the compressor. Now, it's not a good idea to have a shaft in the center of a nuclear core because it's, you know, it's, some, you know, it's the harshest environment possible. It could become brittle, so you have problems there. Plus, they were using ball bearings. Uh, but it is a design that actually was developed, was uh, got to TRL 7, TRL 8, and worked for several hours. And there were actually two companies doing this. One was G, and one is what is today Lockheed Martin. So, and they had two different designs. So these things worked many, many years ago. So what I did, I said, okay, I took all the problems I had and resolved them with modern engineering by, first of all, I don't want to use air. Air contains also contaminants, uh, water vapor, and whatever else in the air, which at high temperature reacts with these alloys. And then you have to have a maintenance program, a, a survey program, so cost. No, we don't want that. So everything is intubated. We are using helium, helium gas, which has a, a excellent um, transfer properties. Everything is welded because helium is extremely difficult to keep in, a, in, a, in any place. So seals don't really work, for uh, especially for something that goes up and down in power. So everything is welded shut. So there is no access to this unless you have to cut it and open it. But that's also why we don't want to have lubrication and circuits like that, because we don't want to maintain anything. This is a drone. Once it's done, it lasts. All of the time it has to last for the core to be spent, but you don't need to maintain it. That's, uh, that's one of the key uh, features for that. So uh, everything is intubated. Um, Helium doesn't become radioactive. So originally this design was designed for uh, application for military applications. So the idea was that if uh, somebody shoots at the reactor, it would have a puff of helium, but it's not radioactive. So the soldiers there would not be affected by that. So that was the idea. Uh, let me speed up a little bit. Um, so here's to cement the, uh, let's see if I can make this work. Okay, perfect. So this is a turbojet typical uh, that you fly with any airplane today. So we have air on one side, you have fuel, they mix together, you ignite them. The pressure uh, and temperature goes up, the uh, mixture of exhaust gases, high temperature expands in the turbine, and you get, in this case, thrust. If you want to have a, a generator, you put electricity out of that. So all of essentially is all of this intubated. The combustor is no longer there, there is a nuclear core instead. And uh, as I said before, we don't have a shaft going between. We have a generator that is spinning at its own speed and a compressor motor that is spinning at the best speed for that compressor. So um, is it true? Uh, all of this, you know, is it true? Yeah, it's true. We actually made a, a simulator that has uh, this, this essentially the characteristic of this reactor in a uh, warehouse in Manassas, Virginia and torture the hell out of this thing. <laughs> um, uh, literally, we did, uh, you know, we did every kind of uh, uh, test. We took away the coolant. We killed the electricity. Uh, we overheated the, the heaters. There is no nuclear fuel here. We are using electrical heater. Yeah, that's a minor detail. Minor detail because my, my employees are working literally here. So it's not healthy to have a nuclear system right there, especially if you, if you make a mistake. So this picture is a uh, infrared picture showing something we discover uh, when you go very small with uh, this type of system, you lose a lot of heat that normally in a large power plant is not accounted for uh, because it's negligible. In a large power plant, the heat loss is about 1%. But in a very small reactor or anything small, in fact, when you look at organic ranking cycle, you actually cannot see them. They are all covered with blankets of insulation because as soon as you lose heat, you lose efficiency. So that's a very important aspect to, to remember there. So now I'm going to go straight into the ARPAE. ARPAE is the Advanced Research Project Agency. Uh, e stands for uh, energy. So uh, Autogen was awarded in 2018 uh, a relatively small grant to demonstrate all of this with the help of the national laboratories. 
So we provide all the information to the national laboratories. And as uh, uh, we'll show you in a second, my generation zero, so we, we have now generation two plus over here. So generation zero was the first reactor design that I, pro I provided, which I had mobile SPM. So those, those modules you were seeing before, all welded shut, they were actually moving inside the container. By moving, you leak neutrons. And so I was controlling the system by controlling neutron leakage. So this is was done in, the 40 in 1944 and 45 for the first time during the development of the, of the bomb. So they were moving reflectors and changing the activity for the demon core by moving graphite or beryllium reflectors. So I said, why don't we do this thing for beneficial uses, not just for bombs? So the idea is to, if you move them, you don't need control rods and you don't need control drums, which simplifies the, the design dramatically and also reduces the cost dramatically. So this is a picture from National Lab, from Argonne National Lab, doing the neutronics, showing that actually it could work. In fact, one foot distance between these SPM kills the reactor. So you, you lose so many neutrons that it kills the reactor automatically. So the idea was to have the two SPM at the bottom hydraulically lifted up, and if you lose power, those hydraulics uh, will go down, and automatically the reactor is killed by itself, so by gravity without control rods, all those type of things, which, as I said before, cost a fortune. This uh, uh, plot here in the, in the middle is just, or each dot here represent a feasible core that can be used uh, through a, this algorithm, genetic algorithm that was developed by Argonne National Lab. And um, what they did, um, this was a challenging design also for them because it's unusual. You normally don't have a core that moves. The core is fixed. And w what we gave them is a very challenging uh, problem to solve. By doing that, they develop all these engineering tools that allow you now to essentially decide which parameter you want to prioritize. In this case, was mass, core weight, or core lifetime. And then you can pick and choose the one that fits your application. So um, this on the, on the right is the actual final version that we have right now uh, with the project with Alpai, which was completed in March this year. So here's what uh, uh, just gives you an idea of having the control of reactivity by moving from outside, which will be much simpler uh, with uh, actuators. And by moving them closer or farther away, you have more power or less power. So it's a very elegant, again, there is no moving part inside the system where you don't want stuff inside the core because that's the harshest environment of the system. S so that said, let me go back to this one. So this summarizes what I just said. So this was uh, mobile, then we fixed them. So why would we fix them? It was perfectly by moving them, but I got a lot of criticism. It's too innovative, essentially. And so you, know, you need to take this a little bit, one step at a time. And uh, the regulators would never be happy with something moving. So go with something that it would be more digestible. So reluctantly, I went into this configuration, which is not moving, but now we have to use control rods, which are these guys over here and control drums, which are these uh, green uh, uh, round things that you see here. So you can regulate power by moving these, these abs neutron absorbing material. This picture on the side, uh, on the right here, shows you that this, we call that nuclear cartridge, which is one quarter of the core. This cartridge fits very nicely inside a shielded container, so it's easily transportable as spent fuel, and you can still walk around it without being zapped by radiation. So. So that's not, uh, not a negligible thing. So here is the um, design we went through uh, with ARPA-E funding, where we developed, we had to demonstrate this with high fidelity code through the national labs, but also we had to validate that those codes are actually on target. So what you see here quickly is uh, the high-speed compressor. These are magnetic bearings. So we had to uh, design them, build them, and test them, and show that actually it works. Uh, these are the high-speed uh, turbines for the compressor on this side. This is the expander. And this is the fuel cartridge uh, in simulation. And I'll show you a little bit more in a second. So this is how it looks all together. You saw that picture before. This is another view of that on this side over here. So these are all the complete system. Uh, here's all the analysis done from by the national labs. So we actually um, tested the actual graphite core. And this uh, uh, relatively pink color um, 
dots here. Those are the heaters that we were using. Uh, this is a, a physical real dimension with the real, um, you know, these, these holes here are fuel channels. These smaller holes are the coolant channels. These are the actual size of the full scale system. So we tested for decay heat removal, passive, what if we lose all the power, so all kinds of accidents. Again, I apologize for the formatting uh, issues with the uh, ch changing uh, system. Uh, so in the back here. So is it true all of we have done in these four years is uh, really what I'm promising? So there are now 18 publications from different sources saying that I'm right. And uh, <laughs> I think I'm right. So, so now the problem is <laughs> t talking to the rest of the world. So since I'm right, should you listen a little bit more uh, to what this, this machine can do for humanity? So that's the question that I'm going to uh, bring up very quickly. Applications, uh, let me see the time, just to make sure that I want to have the time for, time for questions. So applications are mm, almost endless. It's electricity, so you can use it for anything, desalination. Uh, you can use it for uh, charging electric vehicles. This is above surface. This is uh, just a render, situation, a render image. You need about 1.3, 1.5 meters of concrete uh, between you and the reactor to uh, lower the radioactivity when the reactor is on. So there are other configurations where you put the underground, you have no problems anymore. So, um, so that's why I put this, uh, this little uh, transparent image here just to give an idea that it needs to be protected from radiation. I mean, the public needs to be protected. So it could be applied for um, you know, the problem with non-dispatchability of solar and wind. So when there is no wind, there is no sun, you could have one of these reactors that kicks in, is a load following, so it's a drone that fills the, the, bus, bus, uh, the, the power buses and says, oh, there is a load, okay, I'm ramping up. Oh, there is no load, okay, I'm idling. There is no load for, for a long time, okay, I'm I shut it down, I'm not needed. So this also means it would last for a longer time than, not than eight years. Emergency power, that's one of the, you know, definitely uh, easy application because you can drop it anywhere. It doesn't, it could be on top of a mountain, it could be anywhere in the world, in the, in the desert. You don't need water, it's, it could be cooled by air. And uh, you have electricity, if you have electricity, you can immediately provide emergency support. Um, also, you know, the cost of this, just a parenthesis, when I was doing some analysis for Puerto Rico, uh, after what happened there, there was a street in San Juan with, uh, I think there were 20 hotel the revenue loss for one month of uh, not operational because there was no grid of those hotels would have paid for one of these guys. So just to give you, you know, a proportion of, um, it, it could be a good thing also for, a, for the economy of uh, places where there were disaster areas. Uh, uh, here is for remote applications, so Alaska, Northern Canada, Northern Territories. Um, could be marine propulsion. This is one of the uh, aspects I've been working quite a bit, and we uh, was talking a little bit before with uh, Jeff Gaum, uh, mm -hmm. before the, the meeting here, before the event, and I was telling him that the calculations for fuel, uh, fuel, avo fuel avoidance is that uh, you would pay the reactor in two and a half years of operation of the ship. This is a design, it was uh, studied for a medium-sized uh, container ship. So the fuel consumption of those ships, and of course all of that fuel goes into smoke, so it's pollution, uh, was such that in two and a half years you would have paid for the capital expense, and over 20 years of operation you would have saved 1.8 billion dollars of fuel for one ship, it's just one ship. So, so it's, uh, it's mind-boggling when you look at these proportions. It could be used for, mi uh, for mines in remote areas where you don't have a power grid, and normally everything is tracked with diesel, uh, very expensive diesel because of logistic issues. It could be used for space, it could be used underwater. So essentially there is no limit to the application for, for the technology. So this is just an example of how it would be, you, you locate this thing essentially somewhere um, surrounded by water, so water is going, going to be the shield for the system. And then you have these, um, these are actually commercial electric 360 degrees pod. There's a basically an electrical motor attached to a propeller very efficient propeller, and you can retrofit even an old ship with this technology, and then you distribute the power through a cable. So, so that is another very feasible technology. I'm having always the reverse. 
Okay, so uh, this is just to summarize a little bit what you can do. There was also a baby Olos design that was for space. Uh, this was just for uh, from 10 kilowatt, actually um, 10 kilowatt to one megawatt, um, but it can operate all time at 100 kilowatt. Uh, this was another smaller 20 foot container, three megawatt more or less that we can contain. And you see you have all these application that can help anything where you don't have a grid uh, or the grid is too expensive to maintain. So it's a very distri distributable design. So this is to give you a, a summary of the uh, long-term impact. So we talked about these uh, subcritical or sealed uh, uh, power modules where everything is contained inside. There is no equipment outside. So the only thing you have is a, is a box or the connection of three phase cables at one of the end of the system. Everything is integrated, no balance of plan, nothing comes out of the container. Then you can transport them individually or all together when it's fresh. When it's uh, radioactive after operation, you can separate them and transport them all to, uh, um, individually through a shielded container. L right now I'm, I'm using uh, showing you just the cartridge, but it could be longer. It was just a waste of, s of mass and waste of material but it you could also put the entire thing, this entire thing inside a shielded container. It would be just a 40 foot container, not a 20 foot container. So that's, that's all feasible. Um, summarizing this, um, okay, what was here was Meitner. Meitner is the funding program under RPAE. Um, so before RPAE, I made this prototype, again, to be believed. Uh, and I used uh, parts from a Subaru. <laughs> from a Subaru uh, turbocharger uh, modified. This is a high performance uh, race car intercooler. Um, inside here there is graphite and these are the heaters simulating the, let the, the heat from the reactor. And I was showing that as you increase the heat or decrease the heat, you have more electricity or less electricity, which is a load following, one of the load following aspect of the design. So here's, we went from 2018 essentially to 2022 and now we have uh, this generation two plus uh, validated by the national laboratory. So I'm no longer the crazy guy in a garage saying that it can be done. <laughs> uh, or maybe I'm still the crazy guy, <laughs> but, but uh, it's a little bit better. So this, uh, this slide is just to show, this is a token of, uh, of uh, gratitude to Jeffcom and UXC. Uh, this, is, uh, this picture is showing you um, a report we produced in 2010 and it was about SMRs. And so we had to uh, develop all these studies of all these reactors and fi figure out which one has better economic performance, better probability to be satisfying the grid or some other ranking parameters. And so this was uh, a, the child of essentially Jeff Gom because he is the owner and uh, the founder of the UXC and he decided to hire somebody like me, which is highly technical to work with some of the eco economy uh, economies that they have in the company and try to merge these two knowledges to figure out a better way to evaluate this technology. To do that, we had to go through about 900 designs. That was a torture. Uh, it took years, but it was also extremely helpful because it helped me to figure out the defects of different designs. And out of that, I could extract what is good and made all those add out, out of all that filtering. So that said, uh, I think we should, uh, I'm right on, on the 44 minute uh, for quest question. And if there is time later, I can show you something else, but we can go straight to the questions. Well, thank you, Claudio. That was fascinating. Um, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll come over with a microphone because we are recording this and uh, get your question. So just raise your hand if you have a question. I see one way in the back. So I'll stop the brave young man way in the back. So I was wondering, like, how how resistant are these to, like, if somebody came and decided they wanted to blow up a portable nuclear reactor, how how feasible is it to, like, easily defend these? You, you, you mean, uh, if I understood well, how uh, feasible the, the technology is? Is that your question? 
Ju no, just like defending them from attacks. Oh, defending them from attacks. Mm. Very good. Yeah. Very, very good question. So many, many years ago, I went to some friends of mine at the NRC and I said, you know, the world is becoming crazy. Sooner or later, somebody's going to shoot at the reactors. So, oh, no, no, that's not NRC. That's uh, defense. It's not our problem. It's the Department of Defense. So well, regardless of whoever, the problem is somebody's going to shoot at the reactors. And they were like, no, 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 this, the probability is extremely low. Now we saw that on TV, uh, the, the Russians shooting at the reactor. So um, ODOS has, uh, was designed for military application originally, and uh, not because I'm so keen toward the direction, but because military normally are known to have more funding and many technology from military then eventually migrate to civilian application. So he has a lot of features to uh, cope with uh, um, shape charges to ballistic attacks to saboteurs uh, to give an idea. One of the questions was, uh, suppose we have 40 uh, uh, guys armed to the teeth and 10 are killed, but 30 makes it, make it to the reactor. What does the reactor do? And so the reactor has a lot of features to defend itself, uh, but for civilian, I tune down all of those features, but they are basically ready to be implemented if needed. So it's a very good question, and I'm with you 100%. It should be designed as if it is always dropped in a hostile environment. Okay, and a, and a lady with a question right here. What happens at the end of the useful life of it, and what do you do with the materials at the end of the useful life? V very, very good question. So. Like every nuclear reactor utilizing fission, um, it would produce fission fragments. The fission fragments are the radioactive nasty part of the nuclear uh, equation. So uh, as, I, as I was uh, uh, explaining before, one thing is if you increase the efficiency, your total volume of spent fuel reduces because that fuel made more megawatt for, the, for that amount of fuel. So that's number one. But at the end of the day, you still have an amount of spent fuel to deal with. So I went into the um, uh, research to what is done by the Department of Energy for uh, spent fuel transport and spent fuel storage. And I was shocked to find so many inefficiencies everywhere in these steps. So for that reason, I was thinking we are better off to design our own casks uh, for smaller systems than going with this, this massive system where you have to have all these people involved uh, you have to know which route you're going because if you go to that bridge and the bridge might not have enough rating capability, it might actually crash with this weight. It's a very massive system. So, um, so the problem is going to stay there, but uh, uh, my approach to it is if you reduce the size, it will be easier to store and it will be easier to protect. The best thing to do is basically drill a hole and put it not that deep, just in its own cask in that hole so that it will be okay. The other part is, which I mm, forgot to mention, the fuel for this core is not conventional fuel. It's ceramic fuel called TRISO, T-R-I-S-O, which is a tiny, it's made of one millimeter diameter ceramic silicon carbide coated spheres. Extremely tough to break. Uh, they don't melt up to about 2000 Celsius. So it's extremely tough even to melt. So even if you break it, it's very unlikely you break the spheres. You can break the core if there are chunks of radioactive material sitting around. As long as you don't get close to it and you send a robotic to pick it up and put it into a canister, you don't have volatiles, you don't have gases. So that's the number one uh, part that I'm thinking. So if it is remaining solid, and these trees of fuel was engineered originally for a long, long uh, repository type of, uh, uh, of um, uh, format. So then they come up with the idea, well, if we can do that for a long time of uh, storage, why don't we use that directly as a fuel? So that's basically how Trezo came as an idea to be used as fuel. So two things, dimension, I mean, actually three things, uh, reducing the quantity by having a more efficient system, um, reducing the, the volume that you are transporting, so your risks are reduced by, by mass. There is less mass to, to break and there's less mass to sabotage. And then the other part, use a fuel that even if you do manage to break it, it will not release gases. So if there is no gases, it's going to be limited to the area where, say that a missile hits that. You have a crater and you have all this junk around, radioactive. 
which is worst possible case scenario. But nowadays we are watching TV, it's very possible uh, with the world the way it is. So you want to have a design that is ready, you know, um, proactively thinking about that. And in that case, you to have to have a robotic system that goes there, picks up everything, take it a few inches from the soil, put it into this cask, put the lid on top. That's your environmental uh, reconditioning of that area. So it's not perfect. Um, there will always be fission fragments and will last for a long time. But again, it has to be looked at relati in a, re a, re a relative way. You know, you have to look at how much pollution we generate by not doing that. And what is the harm from this pollution versus uh, these tons of waste that is uh, very confined and could be trapped into a, a steel and concrete uh, cask? Yes, uh, my experience with uh, compact equipment of any type is that you always pay a price on accessibility for maintenance. Yeah. So my question is, uh, how can this equipment be properly maintained throughout its life? Uh, excellent question again. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the approach I have was I don't want to maintain it. I want to make it tough enough that can go on for 10, 15 years without touching it. Now, from turbo machine standpoint, if you talk to turbo machines, that's impossible. You have to maintain, change the seals, change, you know, the bearings. You have to maintain the system. But the way is that this approach, this is not for flying. So if a turbine blade thickness that is exposed to radiation could, could uh, crack. All you need to do is make it thicker. It will be heavier, but uh, you're not flying with this, so it's not a problem. So the other part is magnetic bearings, no contact ever. So with a lot of redundancy on the magnetic bearings themselves, so there are multiple magnetic bearings, so you can have failure of multiple magnetic bearing, and eventually if all of them fail, there is something called catcher bearing, which is a bearing that is only a few microns distant from the shaft. And if the magnetic system fails, the shaft hits this magnetic, this uh, catcher, which is designed to survive 10 for, you know, 10, a number of, of, of crashes. And then eventually you have to cut the system open and change that bearing. So the idea is to eliminate maintenance as much as possible. Everything else is, is electronics um, and what can go wrong is uh, overheating of electronic modules, but those are kept in a way that you actually can access them, unplug them, put another module, replug it, and continue. But the actual reactor system sealed with helium, that is like your refrigerator at home. You never maintain it. Y you don't charge re refrigerant in your refrigerator. It could last 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, sometimes even more. So it's the same concept. You design in a way that is tough enough that you don't need to maintain it. So that's, that's the approach. Oh, okay. Other questions out there? Yes. You said you use helium. What other source of uh, coolant would you use if you didn't have helium? W what other uh, sources of like supply of helium? Yeah. So helium has become uh, uh, more and more uh, in demand and more expensive, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a market issue. Um, it's not a technological issue, so it's, um, it's, a, it's a demand type of uh, problem. Um, we, don't we are not married to, to helium. Helium was designed originally for military bases. If it is civilian and is inside a you know, construction or underground, we could use different gases. Uh, if you use different gases, it will become bigger. So if you, d if you don't want to exceed the container, then in order to use another gas, you have to reduce the power rating. So 10 megawatt helium fits inside 40 foot, a 40 foot container. But if you want to have nitrogen, for example, you might only be able to fit maybe four megawatt inside that system if you don't want to exceed the boundary of the container. So, yes. so there are multiple gases or a uh, different way to, to make it work. If helium will become unaffordable in the future. If you have tickets to the eight o'clock planetarium show, we've got about four minutes before the show starts. Just wanna let you know. <laughs> Other questions out there before we wind things up? Oh, way in the back, all right. Anybody up front? Well, I'm down here. Oh, there's one, yay. So just in terms of uh, your dream outlook 
say how far are we out from looking at this picture and uh, giving like a, a billion people in Af Africa access to electricity uh, uh, with, with, you know, renewables included. So uh, you, you're asking how much time it would take to, to have one? To, to yeah, to get, to get from this and to get this all Perfect. over the world where it's needed and, and, and that type of thing. Ve very, very good question. I, I, I'm happy you asked that question. Yeah, so three years. We have a plan designed for three years implementation with all the nuclear tests included. So, so we, can, uh, we can have that uh, uh, first of a kind, which would be the most expensive. Uh, and then we have the end of a kind, which would be a number of them. In a way, the reactor design is such that if you look at the, see, in a way we have four reactors already, so we have four of everything already, so four, component, time, four times components already reduce the cost of manufacturing. It's not one. So even the first of a kind is already four, um, which already, you know, when you order stuff to a center, a, a CNC machine center, if you order one, it costs something, but if you order two, it costs a little bit less, three, a little bit less, four, less, 10, much less, 100, much, much less. So, so, uh, so three years is the time. Uh, many people say that's impossible. Uh, it's possible if you approach it the way we approach the same thing we have done for, uh, for DOE RPAE, where we, was, we were told it was impossible to build a simulator in such a short time with so, so little money. It's not true. It's just uh, commitment and good people that really want to make things happen. All right. We got a question right And of here. course, money. <laughs> Minor detail. Hey, Michael. <laughs> um, what would be the w total weight of a unit similar to what you're showing there? Perfect. So this one, which would be about three megawatt, is a, it's a by requirement for military, would be 40 tons cannot go above 40 tons. In our case, we have a lot of weight from graphite. There is so much graphite inside the system, uh, and that's what brings the weight, because everything else is essentially part of jet engines, so they're not that heavy, literally. The, the system itself uh, is not that heavy. It's ceramic. Um, there is not that much steel. Uh, it's probably more heavy. I mean, there is a lot of weight on the, 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 the structure of the container because it's highly reinforced plus there are shields. So 40 tons, for 40 tons for three megawatt. A 40 foot probably we go to 60, 70 tons. All right, well our last question, way in the back. So I was also wondering how easy would, say if I had unlimited time and tools with this to turn it into a nuclear bomb? Uh, I didn't understand the last part of the question. Could you, could you? If you had unlimited time and tools, could you turn this into a nuclear bomb? So you can never turn a reactor into a nuclear bomb uh, because uh, it, for a bomb to work, you have to squeeze the material together. So you need a lot of explosive to, to really jam it. What you have here, as soon as you have something that breaks it, it breaks it apart. So you can never have a mushroom you know, bomb out of this thing. All worst case scenario you can have is it would become very hot. But because this is made of ceramic, it could go for a very short amount of time to about 1200 Celsius, which is basically uh, the filament of the light over, uh, over there. It's basically that temperature. And then it would immediately decay on its own. So the worst case scenario is just leave it alone, walk away, and it would cool down by just sitting there in the air. So it can never become a bomb, even, you know, the the Fukushima was not a bomb. I mean, it was the hydrogen that blew up. It wasn't the actual reactor. Uh, in uh, Chernobyl was the reactor core, but it wasn't a real nuclear bomb. It was high pressure, high temperature, and it broke apart everything else, anything pressurized in a pressure vessel. So you can never have a bomb from a nuclear reactor. It's not designed. Y y it's just impossible to do it. You have to basically surround it by explosive and compress it in an impossible way. So there is no way you can do it. So, uh, and I'll be happy to explain that in more details if you want later, but y y any reactor will never explode like a bomb under whatever accident scenario or even sabotage. It just cannot become a bomb. So Claudia, would you like to share with the audience your most exciting engineering adventure you've had in the development of this technology? 
So, um, yes, sure. Um, this is one of the many stories. So one of the things we have done, I uh, have a very small team of engineers, and we want to use a turbojet engine from uh, a dear jet. We bought it uh, on eBay, if you can believe that. <laughs> and because we needed to have six megawatt on command. And six megawatt is a lot of power. So we called the utility, said we need six megawatt to do testing. I said, yeah, sure, we can do that. Uh, it's $1 million per mile. It would take, you take us about four years to get you a new grid just for you. So you can have the six megawatt and you can never test without uh, reserving power. So you can only test at night because you destabilize the grid when you have six megawatt. So we had to come up with uh, some clever idea to get six megawatt somehow, somehow. So I come up with the idea to use a helicopter or a aviation jet engine, intubate it and use the exhaust gases as a heat source so we can get six megawatt. So the first thing we, and actually there is a little, <laughs> just this is actually the, the type of engine that we've been messing with. So this gives you just an idea of that. So this is uh, uh, the exhaust part. So this is the nozzle at the end. These are the combustor chamber here. These are the injectors here. This is all compressor. And this is the fan at the inlet. So if you look at the rear jet at the airport, what you see is the front part. So this part over here. So, um, so it's a tiny, you know, it's not a big guy. It's, uh, you know, this diameter is not that big, but it, it's extremely powerful. Uh, I mean, you can fly a helicopter with that or a Learjet, uh, if anything. So, um, so we had to test this thing because we had to create this rig that gives you six megawatt. So we bought it, we received it, and we are four or five of us, and we put this thing on, on a pickup truck, strapped it, <laughs> and waited that everybody left the warehouse complex where we are, uh, turned the back of the pickup truck toward the woods, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully nobody walks in that direction. And then we put fire extinguishers everywhere. Somebody you know, uh, dropped there a 55 gallon jet fuel to the system. So we are scared to death because we never, you know, we, are, we have a theoretical knowledge, but we never really messed with a real turbojet. And we asked, you know, aviation expert, they said, don't do it, don't do it, don't, just don't do it. <laughs> and of course, why not? We have, we have to do it. So, but we put all the safety we could, so we put a bunch of fire extinguishers, and we were telling one another, if this happens, you take that fire extinguisher, so don't panic, you just focus on that one, I focus on this one. So we have all this safety briefing for the entire day, around midnight or past midnight, we start finally the test. And uh, as, as soon as we start running the engine, we smell fuel like crazy, so there's something's wrong. And it's pitch dark, so we put a light and we see this spray of fuel coming out from one of, actually really one of these injectors over here. And so stop, 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 stop everything, you know, before it catches on fire. So we have a, the wrench, we tighten it up. So I'm basically soaked in fuel. And, um, and uh, one of my employees said, Claudio, Look, look back, and there is this jeep with a fire marshal. <laughs> and I'm really trying to dry my hands from this stinky, stinky fuel, and I'm um, thinking, what am I going to tell him? You know, yes, we are here trying to test the jet engine because we want to mimic a nuclear reactor. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's just, what am I going to tell this person? So I am walking toward this jeep that is moving very slowly and the guy is looking at us, looking at the fire extinguisher, looking at the 55 gallon tank, but he's not stopping. And I'm walking toward the car, the van she looks at me and looks at everybody and sped up. So I remained there like, what was going on here? And uh, so uh, I looked to my, to my crew and I said, you know, apparently in uh, Manassas, uh, having a pickup truck with a jet engine strapped to it doesn't qualify as a fire hazard. <laughs> so, so we're okay. <laughs> but this is one of many, but I don't want to keep you here all <laughs> evening. So I'll be happy when the opportunity arises to give you many other stories that are very similar to this one. Well, Claudio, thank you so much for your time this evening. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. And thank you. Thank you all for being here too.